So this morning I'm starting a brand new series on parenting. And I know a bunch of you already went, oh, because you're thinking, I'm through that phase in life. I don't need that. Well, let me tell you why you need it. Because what you need to do is listen carefully to all the mistakes your parents made so that you have an opportunity to tell your therapist why you're so messed up. So this, this is going to work just fine for everybody. Trust me on that. Let me begin by saying this. We have this chorus that we are hearing from world leaders everywhere, and they're all saying the same thing. When I say this, you'll know you've heard it. And they're all saying that the greatest problem facing humanity is climate change and the breakdown of the ozone layer. And what I want to tell you this morning is that that is not even close to being the truth. The biggest problem facing humanity is the breakdown of the family. And the family is in such crisis these days, and parenting in particular. And let me explain this. See, when we, when we read about stuff in the paper, when you look, turn on the news, and, you, and you, you see the way people act, and you see the way people are living, and you see the kind of disregard uh, for one another that we see in the world, let me, let me explain something. Someone doesn't wake up one morning and decide to be an Islamic terrorist. Someone doesn't wake up one morning and decide they're going to be a schoolroom assassin. They don't wake up one morning and decide they're going to be an immoral and corrupt businessman or politician or whatever. It doesn't happen like that. Every one of these people is a product of their upbringing. And the failure to parent is what is causing this to end up the way it is ending up. And I want to speak to you about something because there's a, a bit of a lie out there that all you have to do is love your kids. And if you will just love your kids, that will be enough. And it is true, there is nothing more important than loving your kids. But let me tell you, you can love your kids more than anything in this world and still un end up with dirty, rotten scoundrels at the end. You know, it's like this, this, this mother and she had four sons. They all ended up in prison, all criminal element. And when the fourth one went to prison, she was being interviewed by the local pr paper and said, look at your four sons are all in jail. If you had it all over it again to do again, would you still have kids? She said, yes, just different ones. <laughs> And so my series this morning is entitled Parenting on Purpose, and that's kind of a two-edged sword. There's a double reference there. Number one, parenting on purpose instead of by default or accident. And so the whole idea is that parenting has to be very, very intentional. But the second part of it, parenting on purpose, I mean parenting with a purpose, knowing going into it right from the very beginning what your purpose is. And see, when you have kids, a lot of times we're not thinking about the long term. We're not thinking about where this thing is going. When you have a brand new baby and bring it into this world, you know what, you're only thinking about one thing. I'm gonna try not to kill it. Uh, you know, it's so helpless and so hopeless and it just lies there limp and you have to do, and, you, and you're not even thinking about what it's gonna be like at 15 or 20, 25, you're thinking, if I can just get through the first year without killing it, I, that would be a success. And I wanna remind you that that is not enough and that we need to have a purpose or a vision and know, know what, is the, what is the bullseye? What is, the, what, are, what is the target we're ending up at? You know, Stephen Covey of Seven Habits of Highly Effective People said you always have to begin with the end in mind. And so here's what you don't know. You don't know at the end what, what your child's gonna do for a living, right? I mean, it could be a doctor, lawyer, Indian chief, butcher, baker, candlestick maker. That's not important. You don't have to know what they're gonna do. But what you want to do is prepare them along the way, starting from day one, as to what kind of people they're going to be. And see, that's all the key in all of this. And you know, this, you know, Jesus is always a great example, but on this, he's really a good example. Because Mary had the benefit of the angel Gabriel showing up and telling her that she would have a son, told her what the name would be, told him what he would do and what he would become. How many of you had the angel Gabriel show up when you had children? How many of you had that happen? So my mom is the only one that had that experience, <laughs> Mary and my mother. But, you know, we don't have that. We don't know. And so we have to decide, what is the, what is the goal? What is the bullseye? How would we know where we're moving our kids in the right direction? And I think there is something in Jesus' life that is so extraordinary. I want to show it to you today. And I think you're going to get something out of it. And what it is is it talks about his purpose and what Mary's purpose would have been as a mother. And uh, here's what we know about Jesus. He came into this world. Uh, we know a lot about his birth. We know a little bit about his childhood. And then there's a, a, a jump, a skip from age 12 to age 30 where the Bible doesn't tell us anything. And then all of a sudden he's 30 and he's an adult and he's launched into his ministry. And of course, we know most of that part of his life. 
And what happened during those 18 years? And do you know that in Scripture there's only one single verse that talks about those 18 years? And I want to show it to you because as a parent, I'm telling you, you want to listen to this and you want to latch onto it because I think it'll change the game for you in parenting. And listen to this. It's, it's Luke chapter 2, verse 52, and this is Jesus from 18 to 30, and this is what it says. One tiny verse. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. And I want you to think about that. It says that these four things, there's actually four there, that increased in wisdom and stature and favor with God and favor with men. And what I'm going to be proposing you to today is that that should be your target. That should be your end goal for your children, that they would be people that would grow in wisdom, stature, favor with God, and favor with man. And if we can achieve that, let me tell you, everything else is going to fall into place. So let's take a moment and, and talk about that. The first thing is this, that Jesus grew in wisdom. And there's a big difference between knowledge and wisdom. You know that, don't you? Well, knowledge is just information. There's all kinds of people that are very knowledgeable and not very wise. Because wisdom is to know what to do and how to do it and what to do with the wisdom or the knowledge rather that you have. And I'll tell you, there's only one place that wisdom, true wisdom comes from. It says that kind of wisdom comes from above. And that's the heavenly wisdom. And the wisest man in all of history was Solomon. And he said this. He said, wisdom is the principal thing. And get wisdom and all you're getting, get understanding. He said, if you can get wisdom, he says, that will make all the difference in the world. And so when we think about our kids, what do we want from our kids? We want them to grow in wisdom. And that wisdom only comes from one place. I'm telling you, it comes from the Word of God. And when we look at our world that is devoid of biblical knowledge, it's no wonder it's in such a mess. And I want to show you something that has happened over the last hundred years. And these are the four generations of the last hundred years. And what I'm going to show you is the percentage of biblical-based families in North America. So I'm going to throw it up on the screen. Here it is. And uh, in the first generation that we're talking about is the builder generation. That was from 1927 to 1945. 65% of them were biblically-based families. And what that meant, those were people that went to church, they believed in the Bible, they read the Bible, they prayed at home, and that was how they brought up their children. And so that was why that was such a great generation. And then you have the boomer generation, 1946 to 1964. How many boomers in the room? And a bunch of us, I'm in that category. 35% of those families are Bible-based. And then you have what was called the buster generation, 1965 to 1983. We're down to 14%. Only 14% of these families are Bible-based families. And then we have the bridger generation, more, more commonly called millennials. And only 4% of families today in that generation are biblically-based. Only 4% are bringing their kids up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, bringing them to church and reading the Word of God and praying with their kids. No wonder our world is so messed up. And we are in a parental crisis because of this one thing alone. And parents, I know. I know it's hard. I know your kids have a lot of other things and a lot of little other interests. And I know that they don't always want to come to church. But you know what? When you forsake the assembling of ourselves together, boy, you're, you're already behind the eight ball right from the get-go. I understand how hard it is. It's like the story of this, this mother. She says, son, wake up. You've got to go to church. He says, I'm not going to church. I hate church. He says, the, 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 the music is terrible. The sermons are long and boring, and the people hate me. Give me two reasons why I should go to church. She says, well, number one, you know, you're 40 years old. And, and number two, you're the pastor. <laughs> That's a true story happened to me. So the first thing that Jesus did was he grew in that biblical wisdom during those years. The second thing is it says he grew in stature. And almost all the scholars agree on this, that it wasn't talking about him getting taller, which is also stature. It's talking about the metaphorical sense, about his stature in the community. And Jesus became a man of regard even before he began his ministry at 30 years old. He grew in that. And so that's what we would want for our children is for them to grow in stature. And then, and then the, the third thing that we see here is uh, favor with God. And Jesus had favor with God. Well, obviously, he was the son of God. But how do you or how do your children get favor with God? I'll tell you how they do that. They do that by obeying him and listening to him and following him. And that's how you get favor. You don't get favor for, with God just because you're a, a member of the human race. Jesus grew in his favor with God. He grew in his obedience and he grew in his devotion towards God. And as a consequence, 
uh, he got that favor with God. I want favor with God for my children, don't you? And let me tell you what my greatest joy is, my single greatest joy as a parent and as a man, I'll tell you what it is, is that my three grown children all love Jesus. There's nothing more exciting to me than that. And, and I've told you this before, I'm so grateful for what God's done around here. I'm so grateful for all of this. I'm so grateful for all of you. I love every one of you. But I'll tell you, I'm, I'm the most grateful because my grown children love Jesus and are all serving him in their adulthood. See, for me, that's the target, right? So, so wisdom and, and stature that they would have presence in the community. And, and then number three, that they'd have favor with God. But then number four, that they would have favor with men. See, we don't want our children to be so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. And Jesus wasn't like that. I mean, he was advancing the kingdom of heaven, but the whole time he was doing good amongst people and he had favor. People flocked to Jesus. They loved Jesus. Why? Because he stood out amongst the crowd. And let me say this to you as parents. As Christian parents, you know what? Your children should be the leaders of this generation, not the followers. You say, well, leaders are born, right? No, leaders aren't born. Why do you think leaders are born? Leaders are made. There's nobody that's a born leader. Leaders are made. And when your kids go out the door in the morning, you should be saying, son, be a leader today, not a follower. Do you really want them following where the world's going? No, you want them leading. And so you challenge them, and it has nothing to do with personality. We think that, you know, leadership is all about, you know, gregarious, outgoing personalities. Not true. Leadership is a, a quality, it's a character of the heart, and people recognize leadership. You know, I, I, this is going to sound like boasting. I'm going to tell it anyway because it's important. See, my son has been a high-performance athlete his whole life and uh, excelled at all sports he's been involved in. He does not have his father's personality, you know, the loud, outgoing, uh, demonstrative, boisterous, annoying personality, you know that one? <laughs> Fortunately for him, he doesn't have that. And so people say, well, he's not like his father and that, you know, he's not going to have the leadership. Well, that's not actually true at all. Do you know that on every single sports team that he ever played on, he was always chosen to be the captain? Why? Because he was a, a man of character. And they looked at him, and he wasn't necessarily the best player. He wasn't necessarily the most outgoing. But they would look at him, and the coaches would look at this man who was full of character, and he, was, and he was honest, and he didn't swear, and he didn't drink, and he didn't abuse other people, and he didn't smoke, and he didn't do all these things. And they, they go, if I want the kids to follow anybody, I want them to follow him. Shouldn't that be the goal for your kids, that you would want your kids to be leaders in their generation? And of all people, if we're the 4% biblically-based families in this room, shouldn't our kids be leading their generation? You should be shouting about now. So, so wisdom, stature, presence in, in their community, amongst their peers, favor with God, and favor with man. And I think that that's about the best purpose, the best end goal you could ever have for your kids. How many of you think that's a good goal for you? You take that. This, is, this was free of charge today, or at the very least, it was worth the price of admission. How, how many you paid to get in here? Anybody paid to get in here? You all came free? <laughs> I'm not saying much, am I? You know, it's like this guy goes to church and he comes home and he says to his wife, boy, that was a terrible service. Awful music, terrible preaching. And uh, so his wife says, well, you know, pretty good sh show for the $2 you put in the offering. <laughs> so, so you get what you pay for. So that's my introduction that everything we're going to talk about from here on is about being purpose-based parents, that what we do is about raising children they're going to have wisdom, stature, favor with God, and favor with man. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to introduce where we're going for the next few weeks. And I'm going to talk about the different phases of parenthood. And, and some know this, some don't, that at every stage there is a different level of parenting and different type of parenting. And a lot of the child psychologists and a lot of teachers on this subject will break this down based on age groups. They all have their own you know, different versions of what they call it. And for your delight and enjoyment, I've used alliteration because it's the best. And uh, here they are on the screen. They're the commander, the convincer, the coach, and the counselor. Doesn't that just roll off your tongue? It's fantastic. And uh, at each one of these age groups, uh, you have to parent differently. And so from zero to five, you are what I'm calling the commander. And you're the commander because guess what? You make all the decisions, right? Isn't that true? You tell your kids what they're going to eat, what they're going to wear, what time they're going to go to bed, and what time they're going to wake up. And so this is the commander phase. A lot of the writers will call it the discipline phase. I'll tell you why I don't really like that. 
because it makes it seem like what you do during the first five years is you spend your whole time disciplining. Not true. You need to be using discipline during those times, but you know what? It's this much love and this much discipline. And most of what you have to give in that period of time is love and care and, and grace and compassion and all of those things. Tremendous, tremendous uh, amount of energy you have to put into this. I mean, what a period of time during this time of the commander. Then there's the convincer. And the convincer, you actually have about five years old, there's a transition from one type of parenting into the next type of parenting. And you're no longer telling your kids what to do. You're now trying to convince them as to why they should do it. And so you go from the discipline phase to the self-discipline phase. And you can't be telling them what to do. You can't be bossing them around and be the dictator in the next phase. You have to change that. And now, because they're smart enough, you're having to convince them why you would want to make that decision. So that's the convincer stage. And then there's the coach stage. And any of you that have been along this journey know that at 12 years old, at puberty, everything changes. And now that you got youth, you need to parent in a different way. And you're no longer the commander or the convincer. You are now the coach. Why? Because they're out in the field. They're living life. They're making decisions. They're getting out there. But you were on the sidelines, and you were coaching them along the way. And you're giving that kind of good advice for them to keep them on the right track and to bring out everything that you would want for them. And then the last and the final phase of this is the counselor phase. And that's at 18 plus. And you say, well, aren't I done? You are never done. <laughs> you are never, it's true. You, those of you that are closer to my age, how many of you figured this out? You are always the parent. You were always the parent, and that never ends. Now, the relationship changes. Because, you, guess what? I'm not telling my kids what to do. I'm not even really coaching them. What I'm doing now is I'm counseling them when they ask for my advice. And here's what will really surprise you that when your kids become adults, they're asking for your advice way more than you ever thought they would. You know why? Because when they were 15 years old, you were as dumb as anything. You didn't know anything. All of a sudden, they're 25. Wow, he sure learned a lot in 10 years. <laughs> and then that's, that's how they look at you. Because all of a sudden, now they're making the decisions, and they're doing life, and they're always coming back. So what we're going to do over the next few weeks is we're going to go through every one of these stages the commander, the convincer, the coach, and the counselor. And we're going to look at them all. And every one of you are all in a different place. You're all on this journey, but every one of you is on a different spot in this journey. And, you know, I'll just be honest here, a little self-disclosing. You know, I don't consider myself an expert on parenting, but I do have one small advantage. You know what it is? I've been through all these phases. I have gone through and seen and witnessed this, and I've raised my children and Kathy, and we've seen what we've produced. And so I have a little bit of experience that I can share with you along the way. And in fact, we're now in the, in the final stage where we're the grandparents. And I love being a grandparent. You know that we had a grandchild just a year ago. And I'll tell you what's so excellent about it. You have all the enjoyment. And none of the responsibility, right? You just enjoy your, your child, and then when he gets fussy, you just give him to his mother and go play golf. And if I'd known it was going to be this good, I would have started as a grandparent. I would have just skipped this phase. But, but unfortunately, that is not how it works. So let's talk about it today. Let's talk about the first phase, the commander phase, from, from zero to five. And I guess the word I would use to describe that, if I haven't already, is you are the benevolent dictator. You are benevolent because everything you do is not for your good, but for the good of the child. And the amount of work during that period of time, it's beyond explanation. I mean, if you haven't been there, you can't possibly relate to the amount of work it is for a young baby bringing one into this world and the amount of 24-hour-a-day care that they require. Our daughter, the, the mother of our, of our grandchild, she, I say, how are you doing? She says, I'm so tired. <laughs> I never get any sleep. I said, don't worry about it. In 20 years, it'll all be over. <laughs> In 20 years, you'll be getting a beautiful rest. I sleep like a baby. I'm the grandparent. <laughs> But I'll tell you, it is so much work. And you're, so you're benevolent, but you're also the dictator. You have to tell them everything. You have to make all their decisions for them. And you have to go along, and you can't just let them make their decisions. You have to decide what they wear and what they eat and, and, and what time they go to bed and what time they wake up. You're making every decision. And here's what's remarkable about this phase. During these first five years, a child's brain will have 90% of its development. 
Even though their body is only, what, a quarter of the size of it's going to be, a quarter of the weight, their brain is already 90% developed. And they learn more in the first five years of their life than they will in any other five-year period for the rest of their life. Did you know that? It is this extraordinary time of learning. I mean, they learn everything. They learn how to walk and to talk and to communicate and to have a relationship, and they learn how to dress themselves. And it's sort of ironic when you think about it. You spend the first two or three years trying to get your kids to walk and talk, and then the next two and three years trying to get them to sit down and shut up. <laughs> and, you're, and you're so excited about when, you're, when your child takes their first steps, and then you realize you've introduced a whole new level of parenting. Because now you need to find them and chase them and protect them and guard them, and, and they want to bash their faces against tables and all kinds of stuff. And you think, wow, why did I ever want them to walk? But that's just how it works. And what they can learn in that first five years of their life is really beyond belief. I mean, they learn, as I said, they learn how to, to talk, but you know, they can learn, they figure this out, that in the first five years, you can actually learn three or four or even five languages in five years. You can't do that, but your kids can. You know, last year, Kathy and I were in the city of Prague, and in order to get a job at McDonald's, minimum wage for young people, they have to know at least three languages. They have to know Czech, and they have to know English, and they have to know German, and maybe Russian. And these young kids working at minimum wage know three languages, and they start off in Czech, and then they find out you speak English, boom, they switch to, to English. The next person over there, boom, they switch to German. And I thought, how is that? Because these minds of theirs are incredibly adaptable, and they're able to learn so much during these first few years that it, it's crazy. So there's no way I can talk about this subject, the commander phase, and cover all the waterfront, because there are literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of things you need to teach your children during this phase. I mean, not only the walking and talking and eating and dressing themselves, but how about the, the human skills? And how about relationship? And how about abstract thinking? And the list goes just on and on and on during that, that first five years. So I thought about it. I thought, what, what is it that I could give you folks that are in that phase that would be one or two things, a couple of nuggets that would really help you? And then it came to me, the two things that I think they're absolutely essential that you don't want to miss out on during that phase is honesty and respect. I'll tell you why they're so important. First of all, is because these things are not natural. They are learned behavior. You are not born from the womb uh, honest or respectful. In fact, the scripture says, Genesis 8, that the, the, the imagination of a person's heart is evil from his youth. Why? Because we were born with the sinful nature of Adam and Eve. And honesty and respectability and those things, they do not come naturally, so we have to turn them and teach them and train them in these things. But here's why they're so important above all the other things, is because you cannot have good relationships without these things. If you don't have honesty and respect, relationships will never work. And honesty, let's talk about that for a moment. Honesty is the one thing that if you don't have it, it will break relationships. Dishonesty breaks relationships. So if we don't get our kids to understand truth and untruth by the time they're five, we're in trouble. Because a child's moral compass is actually defined by age five. By age five, they either know right from wrong or they don't. And if they don't know it, you're in really big trouble. I want to tell you a story. I was listening to a preacher the other day, and, and uh, I, I cracked up. He, he, he said they only had one rule in their family. He had five kids. He said, we only had one rule for our kids, and it was honesty. And I'm thinking, you're lying. <laughs> it was a joke. I thought, but I, and I was saying that because I don't believe you only had one rule, because we all have more rules than that. But I know what he was saying. He was saying honesty for him was the paramount thing. It was nothing more important than honesty, because without honesty, you can't have relationships. And so he said, we instilled this into our kids that above everything else, we expected honesty from them. So he told this really strange story about how he came home from uh, work one day and he went to his room to change and he had a four poster bed with these knobs on the, on the edge of each poster of the bed. And one of the knobs was smaller than the other knobs and there was wood chips <laughs> all over the floor. And somebody, 
probably one of his children, not the dog, had come in there with a knife or a hatchet or something and whittled down the, the, the knob on the bedpost. And he was completely perplexed, and he's tired, long day at work. So he calls his kids in, all five of them. And of course, when you're mad at your kids, you call them by their full name, all three names, right? And you call out the three kids, or five kids, rather. That's 15 names. That's a lot of names. Anyway, he said they lined up at the head of the bed, uh, all five of them, from eldest to the least. And he said, I was going to ask them. He said, I already knew who did it. It's always David. It's always the middle child. And in those of you that have kids, whatever happened, it's always the middle child. You know that, right? And so he said, I lined them all up. And just for sake of argument, he said, I lined them all up. And I knew it was David. So I looked right at David in the middle. And I said, OK, you know what we think about honesty in this house. Who is responsible for that? And he looked right in David's eyes, because <laughs> he was expecting him to say something. On the far end, the youngest, little Jeremy, goes, head down, hand up. And incredulously, he, he looks over to, to Jeremy. He says, it was you? He said, yes, sir. <laughs> and so then he dismissed the other four. And out they went into the hallway and waited to see what was going to happen to little Jeremy. And so then he lined him up, and he looked at the post, and he looked at Jeremy, and he said, I just need to w know one thing. Why, why did you do this? He goes, I don't know. <laughs> Kids are so dumb, eh? <laughs> I, I don't know. And so he doesn't know. And then by this point, the whole thing has become amusing to him. And what he really wants to do is start laughing. But he figures that's pretty bad discipline. And so he had intended that David was going to be getting a spanking. But instead, he reached out and he hugged little Jeremy, gave him this big hug, and he said, thank you for being honest. That's all that matters. How many of you think that maybe that's how Jesus would have handled that? I think Jesus would have, I see all kinds of stories where Jesus handles it just like that. You know, because mercy triumphs over justice. And he hugged his son and thanked him for being honest. And his son went out and the other kids said, what happened? What did he do to you? He said, nothing, which made them more nervous, right? Because <laughs> maybe it's coming. So I was listening to that story, which I thought was rather amusing and reminded me of parenting. Then all of a sudden, something came to me. And I remembered the first moral transgression I ever committed. Now, when I say I remember the first, it may not have been the first. It's the first one I remember. And I was five and a half years old. Remember, our moral compass is in place by five. And I was five and a half years old. And I started grade one. And uh, I'd gone to Oakenwald School. You know where that is? It's right down the street. Oakenwald School is where I went. I started grade one there. And I was a couple of months into it. And I met this kid. And his name was Bud. And Bud became my new friend. And Bud was a great friend because every day he always had a couple of chocolate bars in his jacket pocket. And he would pull out a chocolate bar and he'd give me a chocolate bar. And finally one day I said, Bud, where are you getting these chocolate bars? He says, show up tomorrow at 8.30 and I will show you. Now, I didn't know what to expect the next day at 8.30, but I, got, I ate breakfast early and rushed to school and got there before class at 8.30 because we were going to figure out the trick to chocolate bars, right? Well, right beside Oakenwald School in those days was a little corner store, a little general store right there. And so we stood outside, and he says, now this is how it works. He says, you go in, and you wait till the clerk is looking the other way, and then you grab whatever you want, and you just stick it in your pocket, and then you just walk right out. He says, I do it every day, works like a charm. He says, watch me, I'll show you how it's done. So in he goes, and he's so smooth and so good at this, and the clerk turned, and he grabbed two chocolate bars, stuck it in his pocket, walked right out, shows them to me. He says, what do you think of that? And I go, wow. <laughs> he says, do you want to try it? I went, OK. I was, I was as dumb as a post at five. I'm telling you, I was so dumb and so impressionable. He said, want to try it? OK. He says, J -j just whatever you do, make sure he's looking the other way. Well, I am so nervous about this, because I know it's wrong. But I'm doing it anyway. And I'm going in there, and I'm so nervous. And the whole time, I can't keep my eyes off him. I'm really stealthy, really not conspicuous at all. I'm going, to, I'm going, I'm going in like, like this, staring at him. As soon as he turned away, I was so busy looking at him, I wasn't looking at what I was grabbing. And so I'm looking at him, I'm looking at him. He turned away, I grabbed something, stuck it in my pocket. And I ran out of the store, and I got out there, and Bud said, how'd you do it? I went, oh, great. He says, what do you get? I said, I don't know. <laughs> I stuck my hand in my pocket, and I pulled, it, pulled out the salted nut roll. Here, here, here's the picture. Anybody know what a salted nut roll is? Who knows what this thing is? It's a bizarre chocolate bar. I don't even, you can't even call it a chocolate bar. It has no chocolate. And it has peanuts that are salted and, and sweet nougat on, on the inside. 
It's awful. And, and I pulled it out and I got a salted nut roll. Now I've got two serious problems. Number one, I feel so incredibly guilty. You know why? I was raised as a Catholic. I knew right from wrong. And now I'm going straight to hell. <laughs> why? For a salted nut roll <laughs> that I don't even like. And I'm thinking, what have I done? And so I went into school. I mean, Bud's sitting there eating his chocolate bar. He's, oh, Henry, I got a salted nut roll. I stuck it in my pocket, in my pants, and all day long I'm feeling nothing but guilt. I'm just so absolutely racked with guilt. I can't think of anything else. I'm not learning anything that day because I'm thinking about what I had just done. And I made a decision about halfway through the morning that as soon as school was over, I was going back to that corner store and I was doing a reverse robbery. You know what a reverse robbery is? I was going to give it back. I thought, I have to be free from this. And I could not stand it. The guilt was killing me. And so after school, I went right in there. And again, I'm doing, I'm even more conspicuous this time. I can't, I can't keep my eyes off the clerk, eh? And I'm walking backwards like this. And I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking. And I grabbed that salt and nut roll. And I put it back on, I don't even know if I put it back in the right place. But I just stuck it back on the shelf. And out the door I went. And I'll tell you something, that salted nut roll, did not look like the others. It had been in my pocket all day. <laughs> but I didn't care because I had reversed the robbery. And guess what? I was free at last. Thank God Almighty, I was free at last. <laughs> I just felt such a sense of liberty in my heart that, I, that I'll tell you, that was probably the best lesson that ever happened to me because I had my moral compass tested and the job my parents had done with me for those first five years tested in that early stages. And then I got to determine, and I'm far from a perfect person, but I'll tell you that went a long way to solidifying the fact that I wanted to do what was right in life. Now you want to raise honest kids because honest kids become honest adults and honest adults become good employees and good employers and good businessmen and good friends and good spouses. What's more important? right, than being honest to the people that you live with and live for. And let me just ask you one last question before I move on on this. What do you think the key is above everything else that you as a parent would need to do in order to train your kids to be honest? You got it, model it. It's your example is more important than it. You can tell them all day long what you want them to do, but at the end of the day, monkey see, monkey do, and guess what, you're the monkey. Right? And you need to decide what you're going to do with those kids of yours. So the first thing that is the deal breaker, I think, uh, absolutely essential, is honesty. The second thing is respect. Again, respect is so important to relationships. If you don't have re respect in your relationship, you really don't have anything. But it doesn't come honestly because respect is one of these things that is not part of our human nature. It has to be learned. And uh, when I look at kids today, it's shocking how many of them don't have respect for their parents. They don't have respect for others. They don't have respect for property. They don't even have respect for themselves. And it's the reason why so many kids do so many horrible things and inflict so many things upon themselves. Why? Why? Because they're stuck in this sense of self-loathing. They don't even respect themselves, let alone anybody else. And I remember my son when he played soccer, as I told you, there was this kid on his team when he was a teenager. He's really pretty much the biggest stinker I've ever seen in my life. And, I, and I, it was sort of enjoyable for me to watch him act out like that, but horrible on the other hand. Because this guy was 14, 15, 16 years old, and uh, he was swearing at everybody. He would stop in the middle of a play and let the ball go by and get into an argument with someone in the stands. And he'd be swearing at an adult in the stand. And then he'd be yelling at the ref and, and cursing out the ref, and he'd be getting ejected from games, and he got yellow cards and red cards, and he was into fights every single game. Well, it was fairly entertaining to watch, but on the other hand, I thought, what kind of family does this guy come from? And then I thought, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to scope him out and see at the end of the game if I can find out who his father is. And sure enough, I saw his father one game. Next game, I went and sat beside the dad. And I want to see what kind of parent raised such a stinker. And I'm sitting beside this guy the whole time. He's yelling, he's swearing, he's getting into fights with other team parents. I thought, okay, now I get it. <laughs> now I know what's going on. And see, here, here's the challenge. Because when kids come into this world, they don't have respect for others 
because they are profoundly selfish. They have this selfish nature. That's how they come into the world. They're born selfish, and all they think about is themselves. And when they don't get their way, what do they do? Anybody know? Yeah, they, I've told you this before. They cry. They cry when they're hungry. They cry when they're wet. They cry when they're cold. They cry, cry when they're tired, and they cry at 39 when you kick them out of the house. <laughs> and, and, and it just becomes this, this pattern. And here's the, the secret on this, folks, that by one year old, a parent Will actually a child by one year old has already learned how to manipulate their parents by one. And this is what the studies have shown. And what they realize is if they act out badly, the parent will often give in. And if you don't deal with that early on in those first five years, if you don't deal with that, you are in big trouble. And you have set yourself up for a life of misery if you don't break that selfish will that is within them and instead to earn respect in them. And if you don't do that, you're in trouble. And you've all seen those kids. You're in the Walmart, and some kid, 10-year-old kid, has a temper tantrum right on the floor. How many of you have seen that? I've seen, I have not only seen that with 10-year-olds, I've seen it with a 40-year-old. Yeah, happened right in my office, and the worst thing was he was a member of our staff. Yeah, yeah, our worship leader. So I, I, gave, I gave Derek a 10 cent an hour raise, and it was all solved. It was, that was that simple. His mom's sitting right there. Sorry about that, mom. And, uh, and so, so we have to deal with this whole thing called respect r really early because what happens is they know how to play us and so we have to learn how to, to break that will. And some kids are stronger willed than others. Now in our family, we had, we had three kids, obviously, and, and they were like this. We had one compliant child and we had one normal child, whatever that is, and we had one strong-willed child. Everyone should have one. And, uh, and, and we had ours, and our strong-willed child, she was something else. I mean, I, I was hard to believe. She, was, she would just not keep any rule. She was disobedient on every level. She would not do anything we asked her to do. And uh, when we put her to bed for the nap in the afternoon in her crib, uh, she would wait until we were out of the room and somewhere else, and she would literally climb out, sneak out of her crib. She would sneak down, crawl on her hands and knees down the hall. She would slip a chair up to the front door because she couldn't reach the lock. We deadbolted it so she would not escape. She would undo the deadbolt. She would open the door. She would quietly close the door. We'd be sitting there reading the newspaper, and we would hear a click. <laughs> and Kathy would say, did she just escape from the house? <laughs> Maybe we'll go check. And we would go, and there she'd be running down the street naked, crying, freedom! <laughs> and I don't know what was wrong with us as parents that she wanted to escape, but she, but she did. And these are honest to goodness true stories you can ask Kathy. And one of the things that drove me nuts was, was her love for the VCR. Remember the old days, VCR, VCR tapes, TV? And she figured out at 18 months old how to turn on the TV, how to turn on the VCR, how to load the tape. She can't read. She doesn't know what's on that tape, but she's sticking the tape in. She'd sit there and watch television. She'd hear us coming. She would pop the tape out, turn off the TV, turn off the VCR, and sit in the chair like we hadn't done anything. <laughs> So then I thought, you know what? She's 18 months. I'm 30 years older than her. I am going to outsmart her. And so I started unplugging the VCR and the TV. She would go in, plug them in <laughs> to the wall, 18 months old, and sit there. And then she'd hear me coming. She'd quickly turn off the TV, turn off the VCR, pop out the tape, and pull out the plugs, and sit there like nothing happened. <laughs> so finally, honest to God truth, I went down into the basement, and I turned off the breaker to that room. <laughs> And I thought, if she figures this out, then truly we have the spawn of Satan on our hands. <laughs> I know, it seems a bit extreme, but... So here's what happened. Here's what happened. I'm winding this up, honestly. And so here's what happened. So our compliant child, we never spanked her once, not once. Not in her entire life. All we had to do was raise our eyebrow at her, and she burst into crying, crying and, and that was problem solved. Our normal child, our son, who was just kind of whatever, normal in that respect, uh, we spanked him twice. I spanked him twice. His whole life only got spanked twice. And we were over at some friends and there were these two little kids that were playing on the floor. My son grabs the other kid's hand and bites it as hard as he can. 
kid's bleeding. And so I pick him up. Everybody's, it's pandemonium. They're screaming. They're crying from their parents as well. And so I pick him up and I calmly took him to the other room. And uh, without anger and privately and making sure all of these things, I spanked him and tried to connect the bite because, you know, he wasn't reasoning. Tried to connect the bite and the spanking together. Took him back in there, plunked him down again. He grabbed that kid's hand and bit it again. <laughs> I picked him. By this point, our hosts are beside themselves. I pick up my son. I take him to the other room. I spank him again. This time, we bid good night, and we left. <laughs> but you know what? He never bit again because that discipline built in him that sense of respect for others, right? Now, my daughter, the last one, the strong-willed one, one you might actually know, this one, I spanked her probably nine or 10,000 times. And I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm totally exaggerating. But I mean, she was so hard to get through. To, and I knew that if we didn't, build, if we didn't break that strong self-will in her, I was going to have a life of misery ahead of us. And so we disciplined her more than the others, always respectfully, always correctly, never in anger, never viciously, never inappropriately. And I'll tell you, look at her today. She's the most charming, loving, compassionate, caring human being you'll ever meet. And that's my daughter. I had to redeem that story. <laughs> She's sitting right there. I got to redeem this story. All right, final thought I want to leave with you, and it's this. So, so finally, as we're raising our kids in this age group, we decided to put the house rules up on the fridge. And the house rules said this, I will not yell, I will not get mad, I will not throw things, I will not hit. I will not have a temper tantrum. I will be good to others and respect others. I will be a good person to everybody. Why? Because I'm the parent, I'm the parent, I'm the parent, I'm the parent. We don't have a child or a youth problem in our world. We have a parent problem in this world. And if you can get this right and bring up your children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, you can raise really great kids. And that's my goal for you. All right, so let's all stand together. I'll apologize to my daughter later, don't worry. <laughs> Better to ask for forgiveness and permission when you're doing something like that. All right, so first thing, we're gonna do two things. Please don't run away. Two things, uh, and the first one, if you could all bow your heads and close your eyes. I know that there are people in this room who have never invited Jesus into your heart to be your Lord and your Savior, and wanna give you an opportunity to do that today. And I'm not gonna single you out, I'm not gonna ask you to say anything publicly, I'm not gonna ask you, uh, you know, to come to the front or anything like that. But I do want to make an opportunity for you to make that decision. And uh, if you've never done that before, you're not sure if you're going to heaven, if you were to die, you're who am I talking to? Or maybe you knew him in the past and you've slipped away and it's time to come back. And so I won't embarrass you or single you out, but if that's you today and you'd like to make that decision, I want you to slip up your hand right now. Just right where you are, just slip it up. Thank you in the middle. Thank you in the back. Anybody else want to join these folks? Thank you on the side. Thank you the very back. All right, thank you. Lots of hands going up. Anybody else want to join these folks? It's really that simple. You make a decision. Yeah, all right, fantastic. Lots of hands. You can all put your hands down. Said I wouldn't single any debate out, so let's all pray together. You ready? Lord Jesus, I thank you for the work of the cross, that you loved me so much that you died for my sinful nature. And then you rose again on the third day. And you forever live to be my Lord. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. Today I'm a new creation in Christ. Today I'm a Christian. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give the Lord a shout, shall we? Now, if you just raised your hand a moment ago, I just want to let you know there's a table over there called Discovery. And what we, it'll take one minute for you to drop by there if you raised your hand, or maybe another Sunday and you've never visited. And there's people standing by, and we have a, a gift for you. We have a Bible for you, 
and also a copy of my book, A Greater Purpose. I'm telling you, this will really help you in your walk with Christ and your new journey. And then we'll tell you about a course that's coming up, et cetera. So that's the first thing. Second thing, don't go anywhere. I got one more question for you. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I know that we're all parents, most of us, I shouldn't say all, most of us are parents in this room. And we're all in different phases of this journey. Some at the beginning, some in the middle, and some in the end. But here's my question for you. If you're in all honesty, and nobody's looking around, so nobody's seen you except for me. If you're in all honesty really struggling in this role as a parent, and you need God's help, I want you to raise your hand. I want you to raise your hand. I'm going to pray for you. Nobody's looking around. And uh, I know I've been there. Trust me, I know. It's not, it's not an easy thing. It's not for the faint of heart. Hardest thing you'll ever do, being a parent. And I want to pray for you. Just raise your hand if you want me to pray for you. Hold it up. Hold it up for a minute. You're reaching up to heaven. You're saying, God, I need your help. Father, I ask that you'd send your Holy Spirit upon all of these people, raising their hands and those that should be raising their hands. And Lord, I thank you that you are so gracious and you will help us. And though you've given us this incredibly difficult task to raise children in this world, the 21st century in which we live, Lord, I know you will give us the wisdom to do the job correctly. And I know that these children of these people with their hands raised right now will be the leaders of their generation. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to provoke them and encourage them and coach them and counsel them into everything that you would have for them, that they too would find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord a shout.